From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. You're listening to the Big Ideas Podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Jolie Sheffer, Professor of English and American Culture Studies and the Director of ICS. As always, the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of BGSU or its employees. Bowling Green State University and its campuses are situated in the Great Black Swamp and the Lower Great Lakes region. This land is the homeland of the Wyandotte, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations present and past who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize these historical and contemporary ties in our efforts toward decolonizing history, and we thank the indigenous individuals and communities who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. Today I'll be discussing Public Institutions for the Public Good with Jason Kuchma, Executive Director and Fiscal Officer of the Toledo-Lucas County Public Library. Jason earned both a bachelor's degree in communication and a master's degree in American Culture Studies from Bowling Green State University. He also earned a master's degree in library and information science at the University of Arizona. He's worked as executive director of the Metropolitan New York Library Council before assuming the role of deputy director at Toledo Lucas County Public Library. He was appointed executive director in August 2019. Jason is also a member of the ICS executive board. Thanks for joining me today, Jason. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. You had a really varied and interesting academic and professional journey. Could you give us some of the highlights of some of the kind of major points in your path from, you know, an undergraduate student to your current role at the library? Yeah, it's been eclectic, I guess, to say the least. You know, I started out here as a, I was just telling the story to somebody the other day, as a business student, got a C in statistics and decided that was probably not what I was cut out to do. And so I moved over to communications and got a degree here and you know, at the time that I was uh, an undergrad, I was also involved in the punk scene and writing zines and publishing zines. You know, so I was a manager of a copy shop, and that was a great place to learn how to do graphic design and do publishing and that kind of work. And so doing zines, independent publishing as an undergrad, and after I graduated, continued to do that work and stayed here in Bowling Green for a while, as some folks do. You know, you graduate and stick around for a little while while you figure out what you're going to do next. And then decided I wanted to go to graduate school and wanted to study American culture studies, those were some of the best classes I had as an undergrad and was just really inspired by some of my professors here and ended up for some reason going to the University of Wyoming for a year. And while I was out there, I was working with my professor who was an ecological anarchist, I guess would be the short way to describe her sort of academic focus. And I was, I told her I wanted to write about underground publishing or independent publishing and the role that it plays in kind of radicalizing people from communities of privilege. And so, you know, me as this, you know, middle class white kid who was into punk rock and activism in that sort of sense, like, I really sort of learned a lot in both in my undergraduate classes, but also in sort of reading these perspectives of sort of critical theory in, in independent media. And so she's like, that is great. You should go back to Bowling Green. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So and she had happened to be, you know, she went to, I believe, the University of Minnesota with Joe Austin and Rachel Buff, who are both professors here in pop culture and history, respectively. And so I came back here while I was a grad student here. I also had a chance to work in the music and sound recording archives and also in the pop culture library. So that's where I was like, oh, one of these days, whenever all of the things I'm doing right now is allowed, I'll become a librarian. And so at that time, I had started a zine conference here in Bowling Green with some other friends. And it was in the summertime and we would bring, you know, started out as sort of un- zines and then transferred to underground publishing because it became more than just zines. And then ultimately became allied media projects but we started here in Bowling Green it was a conference for a couple hundred zinesters from around mostly around the Midwest and by the time we were done here we were you know we were bringing a thousand people here in the summertime it was basically kind of a skill sharing retreat for people who were doing independent media around the country whether it was filmmaking journalism publishing you know print publishing this is all sort of pre-internet days too right so you think about how you bring people from disparate parts of the country together to learn from each other and Bowling Green was just perfect because it's you know summertime I don't know what it's like around here now in the summertime but it was pretty quiet we could take over the town and it was so intensive because everybody's here where there's not a lot else to do except be with each other for you know a handful of days and so that 
was really fascinating to me because when we eventually decided to hand off that nonprofit organization that ran that conference, Allied Media Projects, to some folks in Detroit, they're still running it today. So 20 some years later, it's really you know, one of the things I'm most proud of that we built that here in Bowling Green, handed it off to some people in, in Detroit, and they're doing a lot of social justice work. So that I haven't even gotten to going to library school yet. Yeah. But yeah. So then, you know, when we decided to shutter the magazine. It was around a time when a lot of independent press magazines were losing advertising revenue. We were distributed internationally, so it was on newsstands, it was in, it was in you know, bookstores. When we shuttered the magazine, we handed off the nonprofit to the folks in Detroit, and I, my plan B was to go to library school. You know, And so went to, there are tons of really great library schools here in the Midwest, but I felt like it was time to get out of Ohio for a little while, and so went to the University of Arizona. And just had a remarkable experience there. You know, they have a great online program, but being there on campus, I was able to be part of some digital information management certificate program that was started by the Institute of, or funded by the Institute for Museum and Library Services. So it was kind of this pilot program to teach librarians and library professionals how to do digital information management. So I thought I was going to be an academic librarian working in digital librarianship, and that never happened. So when my girlfriend, now wife, she and I both went to library school together. We moved to New York City and got our first library jobs out of grad school. So that was there for about 10 years. Yeah. And then what pulled you back to Bowling Green or the Midwest, I should say, in Ohio, Northwest Ohio? Yeah, it was. So I was in New York City as the executive director of the Metropolitan New York Library Council, which was kind of a nonprofit member services organization for all the different types of libraries in the five boroughs. So hospital, school, special, academic, public libraries. And got a call from a recruiter in October of 2014 at that time, I had four-month-old twins in an 800-square-foot apartment, and the idea of Megan and I both met here in Toledo, and the idea of moving back here at that time seemed like a pretty great idea. And I, it was also at a time where I was trying to figure out what the trajectory for my career was, because as executive director of this member services organization, it had traditionally been sort of a sunset job for people who had been library directors. And so I wasn't sure where I was going to go, uh, and public libraries seemed like an interesting direction and sort of directly aligned with some of the work that I had done in independent media and cut my teeth on here in Bowling Green. So came back to be a deputy director, and my pre- you know, my predecessor who hired me uh, really took a flyer on me because I had never worked in a public library before. And hiring your deputy director without <laughs> any library experience takes some guts, and so <laughs> hopefully... You know, he has since passed on, but hopefully wherever he is, he's like, I, I was right about that guy. <laughs> and then 2019, you stepped into the executive director role. It was, yeah, and I I talk about our institution right now, the Toledo Lucas County Public Library. Is, you know, like we've been in a really weird liminal crisis space for since February of 2019 because my predecessor did announce his retirement in January of 2019. He was going to retire in June, and the whole plan was, you know, sort of do a succession handoff. I was hired on a national search, and then he unexpectedly died three weeks later. Wow. And so the organization was kind of set into this period of grief and mourning. I mean, he as a director had been there for 35 years, so I stepped in as interim director. I was grateful that the trustees thought that I you know, could fill that role and did that until August of 2019 when I was appointed director. And... You know, everything's been smooth sailing since then, right? <laughs> of course, because, you know, COVID, yeah. that had no effect on libraries right. and public right. institutions. Yeah. So, Jason, can you tell us about kind of the current work that you're doing with the Toledo-Lucas County Public Libraries and as an executive director and now sort of getting through the last couple of years with the pandemic, what are your goals for the library system? Yeah, I had... It's a good question because, you know, a lot of us spent the last three years reacting, reacting, reacting. And so I had built my leadership team, you know, after I was appointed director, we did some restructuring and built a leadership team that was in place in February of 2020, just in time for us to go into the pandemic. And, you know, I'm really pleased to, you know, I I think maybe one of my superpowers is surrounding myself with people who are much smarter and more talented than I am and, and having a great team of folks like help us manage through this process. And so in... That winter, December 2020, we got together as a leadership team and said, well, we need to kind of think about what our vision is moving forward. How do we come out of this pandemic? What does the public library look like on the other side of this pandemic? And we worked with Root Strategy in Sylvania, the international company who helped us, you know, does work with some smaller, you know, nonprofits or local organizations. And they kind of helped us do some visioning work, remote work with, you know, eight leadership team members. It was kind of miserable, as we can all attest to a lot of that work being in our own you know spaces 
but we came out you of that. You were trapped in an 800 square foot apartment in yeah. New York City. You move here, and then you're you know stuck in my room <laughs> <laughs> in a bedroom. Yeah, yeah, bedroom office. And we came out of that visioning process with the with the plan that we, or vision that we wanted the Toledo Lucas Kind Public Library to be one of the first places people turn to when they want to broaden their horizons or connect with one another. Thinking about what the library does really well, which is help people expand their worldviews, whether that's even just applying for new jobs or getting our skilling up or you know, reading the next bestseller or, or seeing an author or taking part in one of the amazing programs at the library. So we really wanted to, what we're going to do with the library does really well and remind and kind of reassert that public library institution as this invested infrastructure that we have all paid for as a community to to elevate the work of our community partners around the around the region. Mm. You know, obviously COVID threw very particular hurdles and challenges with public libraries, but can you talk a little bit about you know, even before COVID, some of the major changes that have been provoking like new ways of thinking about the roles of libraries and about how how libraries function? in our communities. What are some of those things that you've witnessed and have been thinking about as you're charting this new course for the Toledo Lucas County Library? Yeah, I mean, we think about uh, just the sort of decline of public space in general and how there really are no places, you know, aside from running to people at Costco or, you know, places like that, like there's, there are very few places, few and further between where people can get together and be amongst each other. And I was just at a conference last fall and a scholar named Tommy Laitio was talking about he focuses on public parks and libraries and, and talking about the idea of conviviality and this idea of, you know, not just harmony, whereas when you have harmony, it means there's power being asserted over, exerted over a certain community so that everybody is rowing in the same direction. There's there's a certain power imbalance there, but when you have conviviality, you've got all kinds of people rubbing up that friction, bumping up against each other, and it creates amazing community. So the idea of conviviality being that you get a rich, robust community by having a lots of different types of people bumping up into each other and experiencing each other's lives. And so I think I've said even sort of before the pandemic, but especially now that the public library has play, can play a really crucial role in helping our communities heal after the pandemic, bringing people together. And it's not just the pandemic. You, know, you think about social and cultural division and that just pushing people further into their corners and how do we bring people back together? Because we have a lot more in common than we have in difference. But to your question about what, you know, the direction of public libraries prior, you know, I think the Aspen Institute did a study uh, or did sort of a listening tour and kind of a visioning process in 2014, I believe, where they reasserted the kind of library as three things, people, place, and platform, which I find really compelling. And it really drove some of my thinking when I came to Toledo to think about how we position our public library, which people use it for all their own sort of individual personal reasons, but how do we think about it holistically as it's the people, it's the staff, the expertise, the customer service. It's also the people that use the library, but it's the place. It is that physical space that we can all occupy, but it's also that platform on which we can build stronger communities. And that's, I think, where we came out of the pandemic with that real focus on the library as a platform. So bringing partners in to do what they do best on this public infrastructure that's already been built and well maintained. It's really interesting hearing you talk because you're, you know, you're, one of the things you're emphasizing is our public libraries as these physical spaces where folks can gather and connect. But we've also seen, you know, in the, the last several decades, like this tremendous shift in so much of the way people access information to the digital. So how are you thinking about those two, those two things happening simultaneously? That's one of the biggest challenges in the public library, and I think for a lot of us, is how do we how do we move forward while making sure that we pull everyone along with us and, and ensuring that there is that equity and, and access. And I think one of the things remarkable about the public library is that it is accessible to our all, regardless of what you have or what you don't have or who you love or where you came from. And during the pandemic, we saw a, a dramatic increase in people using our digital resources, whether it's audiobooks, ebooks, online magazines, and things like that. And it, at the same time, print circulation never stops. One of the things I think is really remarkable about the public library as, a, as an institution, as an idea, as, has one foot firmly planted in history and, and, and firm belief in the ethics and principles of librarianship, but it's also got another foot that's kind of like sticking its toe out and seeing where we're headed as a community. How do we evolve as an institution to meet changing community needs? And I think 
it's it's a pretty special space to be in because we, it does, we do have some freedom and some flexibility to experiment, try things, but we also have this long, long tradition of access and accessibility and, and openness. Can you give us some examples of some of the, the ways that you're reinventing the public library, new programs or experiments you're taking up? Sure. So we just started an experiment last October with a, with a group called Same Cafe, and Same Cafe is the oldest nonprofit restaurant operating out of Denver. And some leaders, community leaders from Toledo had gone out to Denver and been to this restaurant, this cafe for lunch. And we're just blown away by the idea of, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that idea in a second, but they came back and they said, we need one of these in Toledo. And it turned out that the same cafe folks were thinking that, well, we really want to expand this model and try it elsewhere in the country. And so they were looking at a number of different places around the country and decided to settle on Toledo. But then they were looking for a, a, a place to land in Toledo. After three years of looking around, they finally settled on, you know, they had been pushing for the library. We had a cafe space. We weren't sure if we were going to reopen it after the pandemic. And when the current operator or that operator decided not to reopen, same cafe came in. We started working with them. But it's essentially same stands for so all may eat. And it is a participatory model where people pay what they think the food is worth or they volunteer their time or they donate fresh produce that they grew. And so it's really a kind of magical experience, I think because it it just works in, a, in an interesting way where you'd think in this capitalist society where it shouldn't work necessarily, but it really does work. And it was an experiment for us, and I've just been, they've exceeded my expectations at every turn. And so going down to, you know, it's at Main Library, and so going down to the cafe during lunch and seeing families who are visiting Children's Library, you see business leaders, you see our staff eating lunch there, you see people experiencing different types of trauma or, or homelessness, and all sharing meals together, being in the same space together. And it, to me, that's really remarkable. I think that's a good example of how we're trying to, um, again, use that platform to re-engage community. And so some of the other things that we're doing, you know, we we're working with Mercy Health to bring community nurses into our spaces, recognizing that transportation is a challenge for a lot of people to get around the city or the county. And sometimes the public library is really the anchor of a, of a neighborhood or of a community. And so bringing those services out into the community using that infrastructure that's already been invested in, that we already have you know, well t- you know, taken care of in a way that it helps amplify the work that so many of our community partners are doing. We're going to take a quick break. Thanks for listening to the Big Ideas Podcast. Discussion. If you are passionate about Big Ideas, consider sponsoring this program. To have your name or organization mentioned here, please contact us at ics at bgsu.edu. Welcome back to the Big Ideas Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Jason Kuchma. He's Executive Director and Fiscal Officer of the Toledo-Lucas County Public Library. Jason, politics and technology, as we've touched on, have created many rapid cultural shifts in our consumption of information, as you were alluding to earlier, right, from the era of zines to now, you know, things are primarily digital first. Can you talk about the way some of those changes are showing up in the way you're creating programs at the library? When the pandemic hit, we shifted a lot of our programs online with varying degrees of success. And one of the biggest challenges we're having in in public libraries is around our relationship with publishers. And so we've had this long relationship with publishers where they understand that, you know, we buy the books, we have the right to loan them, and it generally helps everyone. It raises the author's visibility, it exposes people to new ideas. They don't have that same perspective when it comes to digital. And so one of the challenges we deal with is the fact that we have to pay a lot more for digital content than we did for print. And we're only allowed to still loan them one at a time. And so you would think that a digital audiobook, which would seemingly be able to be loaned to as many people as have those devices to download it, they, you know, they're still gatekeeping that content pretty heavily. So, and, and we pay, or we might pay $20 for a print book. We have to pay upwards of 80 to $100 for a digital book and still only be able to load it to one person at a time. And so it's a real challenge for us, I think, economically to understand. You know, it's, been, it's been an issue for the last 10, 15 years trying to work through that relationship with publishers. But I think we're getting to the idea of technology and how we're thinking about pushing our services out. We're, we're far more savvy, I think, even just in the last seven years since I've been at the library in, in using data analytics to understand how people are using our website, our digital resources, understanding where are our gaps in accessibility, where do we need to make our resources more accessible to people who might have 
different abilities. So far more savvy, I think, in understanding the, the intricacies that, of how do we mold and, and change our services to meet the ways people are you, you want to use them as opposed to us deciding how people should use them. Tell me a little bit more about kind of some of those new ideas and thinking about increasing access. W- you know, what are some examples of the ways in which you're thinking about formats or being able to, you know, serve a broader array of the community? At the end of the day, print is still the most accessible media. I mean, anybody can take it home and read. Uh, anybody who ha- is able to read can take that and take a book home. And so how do we think about, I'm more interested in reducing the friction for people to get, you know, some of the digital content that we have. We contract or, or sort of license content to loan it out to the community, and it still requires a number of different hurdles for people to to get over to get to that content. And so I think it's trying to figure out where those barriers are and trying to reduce them. So it's kind of like removing those obstacles. I, I, would, I struggle to think about how we're being revolutionary in that digital content. Aside from, I think, one of the things that is really fascinating about libraries in general right now is it's not just about circulating content, but creating content. And I think that gets back to the idea of the library as a platform on where we can build, on a place where we can build new culture, new communities, stronger communities. So you've, you know, writer's workshops, we have recording studios at the library where people can come, you know, record a podcast or, or even music or do video, uh, sort of the, those sort of things, things that people would not necessarily expect to see at the public library. And even at, at Main Library, when we did a renovation in 2019, we built a studio lab in there where there's lots of really otherwise, you know, inaccessible, expensive equipment that somebody couldn't buy for their home, but we were able to, you know, give people access to that. And they can, you know, large-scale printers, 3D printers, those sort of things that allow people to kind of tinker and build new things. I have to say, as a user, I feel very fortunate to be in Ohio, which I think has a pretty incredible public library system. Currently, I think I've checked out like four audiobooks and, you know, four Kindle books simultaneously, even if I have to wait in line. I have to say, like, that process from my end is pretty easy, and the, the variety and the selection is pretty incredible. It's it's amazing. And one of the things that we struggle with is that digital equity question. So how do we, our area of focus over the last year and a half, one of our areas of focus has been around how do we as a library organize our community around digital equity gaps? especially with the amount of federal investment in digital equity and sort of broadband infrastructure that's coming down through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And so we really wanted to be prepared as a community to be able to put those monies to the best use when they start coming into Ohio. And so we started talking to folks about bringing people together to understand, you know, we're talking about educators, nonprofits, elected officials, labor, to understand where the gaps are in our community around people getting online. Is it affordability? Is it lack of familiarity? Is it quality of technology or broadband? We've been working with BGSU's Center for Regional Development to conduct a gap analysis of Lucas County. And as that report finishes up here in in March of 2023, we'll be looking to do that same work around 22 counties in the region as the, we'll be the regional lead for the Digital Inclusion Alliance that will be part of the statewide plan for digital equity. All that to say, you're right, Ohio libraries are incredible because, I, and, and I think we, Ohioans, have been visionary in thinking about how they support libraries. We have state funding for public libraries, which not very many, if any, well, no other states have the same level of, of state funding for public libraries across the board. So a percentage of the general revenue that comes into the state gets distributed out to all 251 public library systems in Ohio, which, again, raises them all up at the same time. And so we, you know, make sure that we have really strong relationships with our elected officials to kind of re- and remind them. And we have the largest per capita use of libraries in the country in Ohio, and it's for good reason because they're they're really well cared for and well invested in. <laughs> we know that universities and public libraries and hospital systems are among major organizations often referred to as anchor institutions, right? These sort of large organizations that are crucial for the roles they play in strengthening the communities they serve. How would you like to see BGSU collaborate with the Toledo Lucas County Library and other organizations to better serve the whole community? Even as a grad student, one of my zines that I did for a number of issues was called Praxis, and it was really about the idea of how do we take our... For me, it was in, in my sort of blunt understanding of that as, a, as an undergrad and even going to grad school, like it, how do we take what we're learning and put it into practice in our community? And so, you know, even at working with, with ICS and, and thinking about how we take what 
people are learning, exploring here uh, in an academic setting and taking that on the community in a way that's accessible and helps us think about where we're headed as, as, as a community moving forward. And so I think, again, reasserting the public library is that platform on which we can take the things that might be happening and maybe in more insular community of a campus mm -hmm. uh, and get them out into the community. And I, even from the early days as an undergrad when I was, I believe we received some community engagement funding from BGSU to help us launch the, the conference. And it was really, I think, visionary to think about how how do we take what's happening in the campus and push it out in the community where not only does it help benefit the community, but the community also then informs that inquiry. You've alluded to this a little earlier, and I'll bring it back about kind of the the heterogeneity of library users and the population. And, you know, I think one challenge that libraries face across the country that sometimes, you know, we hear about in the news is about serving unhoused people in our communities, right? And as these sort of warm, safe public spaces, right, a lot of those folks do rely on public libraries, whether, whether it is for warmth or it is for information access, right? Is there a national consensus building about some best practices for things that should be happening? Or are there things that are happening that you're trying out locally in Toledo Lucas County? I think on a national level, it's challenging because obviously every community is different. But I, I think the challenge for us is that, you know, what the problems you see in the library are community problems. And so part of our vision here in Toledo Lucas County Public Library of doing what we do best, inviting our partners to do what they do best is also a reminder that the library is not necessarily the place to push the unfunded mandates that we haven't dealt with otherwise in our communities. And so I have colleagues around the country whose libraries have been turned into shelters during times. And, and it is challenging to how do you run a forward thinking public library when you're being tasked to do work that a community should probably be handling in another more effective and more efficient way. So I don't know that there is a universal solution, but I do say, you know, folks say, I hear people say, well, isn't that where the, uh, you know, all the homeless quote unquote people are? And, and I will tell them that, you know, the folks experiencing homelessness that we see at Main Library tend to be the most protective uh, folks of the library. They let us know when they see people that are in the community who may not be, who may be new or may be causing problems. And so they are, it is their, you know, it's their institution as well. It's the People's Palace. There's a, a sociologist, Eric Kleinenberg, just wrote a couple years ago a book called Palaces for the People about social infrastructure and public libraries and how they play that crucial role of creating a safety net for everyone in our community. That's what is really amazing about the public libraries, that you do have families of any means enjoying our children's library, but you also have people who might be uh, on a computer learning how to use a mouse so that they get the next job that they need. And that's that to me is... Yeah, it's remarkably rare, I think. Yeah, it's one of the d last few truly democratic institutions. 100%. And I and I joke that, you know, were we to try to create a public library system today, it, it, good luck. It would, it would never happen. To get people to all agree that we're going to put millions and millions of dollars into this institution to benefit everyone. What are some ways that you'd like to see listeners get more involved with the Toledo-Lucas County Library? One of our key priorities for us coming out of the pandemic was to focus on how we help adults broaden their horizons. And the first way to do that is to get a library card. And so we have a goal of getting, I believe, 90% of Lucas County residents with a library card by the end of 2026, which is ambitious. I don't know if we'll get there, but that's the entry point. And that's the first point. And, and, it, and I say that because universally, every time I meet people in the community, or I'm out talking with folks in the community about the public library, they say, oh, I had no idea you did that. Like, I didn't know the library did that. Or I didn't know... I didn't know you had an early childhood literacy program where your librarians are riding on TARDA buses helping parents and caregivers learn the basics of early childhood literacy. Or I didn't know that I could go to a cooking class at the library, those sort of things. So getting that library card is the first step. So whether it's Wood County District Public Library or to the Lucas County Public Library Way or the other libraries in our community, once you get that card, it's, it, is, it is truly a passport. Do you have any advice for younger listeners, so maybe college students trying to figure out what that career might look like, whether they are sort of aware of library and information sciences as a career or whether they are just, you know, creative DIYers trying to figure out their way. Any advice for kind of finding that pathway towards, you know, meaningful professional work? It's funny because I feel, you know, in my role in New York as the director of Metropolitan New York Library Council and even coming here, and I guess as I get older, 
people start looking for that sort of mentorship and advice. And, and I think the, my, the thing for me was just being open to opportunities and just being curious. And I think that one, that's one of the things that I'm trying to instill in my staff and my leadership team is that sort of lifelong curiosity. Because if you're curious, you're always interested in learning more. You're always interested in exploring. You haven't put up those barriers of, you know, uh, to learning. And so being curious and being open to those different challenges, I was dead set on becoming an academic librarian. I still have yet to work in an academic library. But now here I am, you know, working in an incredible public institution that was never even on my radar. And so how do you even, you know, Back to the day when I didn't do so well in my statistics class, so, you know, being curious and open to what other opportunities were here at the university and communication, working at the radio station, those were all things I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. And so even myself, as I get older, we start to like lose our lust for that or our zeal for that curiosity. But it's a good reminder to, to keep that front and center. Thanks so much for joining us today, Jason. You can learn more about Jason and the Toledo Lucas County Library at ToledoLibrary.org. Listeners can keep up with ICS by following us on Twitter and Instagram at ICSBGSU and on our Facebook page. You can listen to Big Ideas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please subscribe and rate us on your preferred platform. For more information or to propose a guest for a future episode, visit us at bgsu.edu forward slash BG Ideas. Sound engineering for this episode was provided by Amir Khan, Brendan Akatura, and Marco Mendoza. Research for this episode was done by Joe Elia.